Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Pan, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is May 3rd, 2024. And uh, Drew, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Drew Stone. I am an American uh, musician, filmmaker, author, and uh, talk show host. Um, born and raised in the, far, uh, in the five boroughs and uh, spent uh, my teenage years uh, in the in the Bronx, um, I sang for many bands, including uh, the High and the Mighty, uh, Antidote, and currently Incendiary Device. And I am the host of the show, The New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, which uh, documents the community and culture, basically, of the American hardcore music scene. Absolutely honored to have you here, Drew. I mean, happy to be here in the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, why don't you start off by uh, let's hear about your family history and background? And uh, sure. And you know, I know your family has a rich history here in the Bronx. So, whatever you yep. know about that and can share about was, that. Did my dad say? Was it Morris Ave? He said Morris Ave. That's yep. right. Okay. So, yeah, my family has a rich history uh, in the Bronx. Um, my father grew up. Uh, on Morris Avenue, which was right off uh, the Grand Concourse. And uh, back then, uh, he, he grew up um, right across the street from Taft High School, which, is, which was the, the high school at the time. And, uh, of course, it was a different world back then. Uh, it was a predominantly Jewish neighborhood. And uh, it, was, it, was a, uh, it was a neighborhood where, you know, people left their doors open and it, it was... Um, you know, quite a uh, close knit community, and uh, my dad, you know, fell in with uh, a bunch of the, the local guys, and they had they had what's known as um, uh, a social club. And back then, you had you know today they would probably call it a gang, right? But back then, it was a social club, and if you were part, you know, he was part of the Stallions which was the Stallions were, a, were, were basically like a Jewish social club that ran the streets of this part of the Bronx. And, and, um, but back then, you know, they had the jackets and they had, you know, the shared car and they had the football team. They had the Stallions football team, which interestingly enough, you know, as I told them I was doing this interview, he told me that right across the street from here as we're doing this interview – is is the, is it uh, is the um, Kingsbridge? Uh, Williamsbridge Oval Park. Williamsbridge Oval Park, and he told me that they played some of their greatest games there. You know, against some other you know rivals uh, in the Bronx. So, my dad, you know, my dad grew up in the Bronx, and and of course, you know, Arthur Ave was very vibrant back then. And um, interestingly enough, and I saw this as I was coming, as I as I came over here. My dad and his guys played golf. They played a lot of golf. This was something that this was something that you know young guys from the Bronx did back then, because there is a um, public golf course right here. You have the uh, the Marshallu golf course, and you have the Van Cortland golf course. So him and his crew were like you know, teenage you know avid golfers, which is very interesting. Is, you know. Um, as you know, you don't hear a lot of that. Yeah. You know, as as sort of street running, you know, thuggish types, <laughs> they were had a passion for playing golf. Wow. And and I and I saw the golf course here, and and I reminisced. And and one thing that I love about it is really, for the most part, Van Cortlandt Park and Moshalu has remained the same. Since the time, you know, when my dad was growing up, you know, in the 40s, uh, in, in the 40s. So, um, yeah, it, it re really interesting. So I have, I have deep roots here. You know, my father, like I said, uh, grew up and, and, you know, just, you know, uh, as, a, as, a, as a young person. And I, I believe pretty much up until the point where he went into the army, you know. And my dad cites the army as really um, saving his life. Okay. You know, because like I said, you know, he was running the streets and and getting into some trouble and hanging out with a rough crowd and being really wild. And his home life was a mess. Um, my grandfather, his father walked out on the family. Um, and when uh, my grandmother 
was sick and in the hospital, uh, my grandfather, my father's father, literally walked out on the family. Wow. And uh, my father and my uncle ended up in an orphanage oh in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, uh, the Israel Orphanage Asylum, because their mother was sick with, with um, um, not leukemia, um, when you, um, the respiratory oh, tuberculosis. tuberculosis, thank you, which was very predominant Absolutely. in those days. So my grandmother was sick with tuberculosis. She was in the hospital, and her husband, my grandfather, my father's father, walked. She's in the hospital, couldn't take care of the kids. My father and my uncle end up in the orphanage on Houston Street in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And they lived in an orphanage for a couple of years. And eventually... She got a bit better. They got out, and they returned uh, you know, you know, to the Bronx. But it's it's a it's a very sad chapter, you know. And and, and you know th this sort of thing, you know, happened a lot back then. People walked out on their families, you know. Um, you know, they didn't have the 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 database reach. I mean, he walked out his family, went went over into Jersey, and started a new family. Basically, you know, pretty pretty crazy stuff. But so my dad was running with a rough crowd and um, ended up joining the army. And it was interesting because back then, everybody from the neighborhood would go in and enlist and would go, would, would, would sort of, I, I don't know if that, if that was the deal or, or, or it was just a known thing. Like, so, you know, 10 guys from the neighborhood in the Bronx went down and, um, and signed up and... They all basically did basic training together, wow. and they all spent a lot of time uh, in the army. This during the, the Korean War, and and um, they um, they served together. Some of them stayed in longer than others. Others some came back, but my dad really cites um, his tenure in the army as really saving his life. And although um, he didn't take to the authority of it all. Um, he learned a lot and certainly achieved a sense of discipline yeah. from it that when he did get out years later, really, really helped, helped him. And when my dad got out of the army, he found his way into the film business, starting initially as a messenger, um, bringing film to the lab. When they used to have boxing matches back then, um, after each round, they would download the film and give it to a, a, met, a runner who would run it to the film lab to develop it one round at a time. <laughs> so my dad's first job in the film business was a messenger yes. running film to the lab for professional fights. Wow. Like, you know, they, they had fights at Yankee Stadium, uh -huh. stuff like that. And he would run, you know, get on the subway and run the film down to the lab, you know. Wow. Really incredible. Yeah. So, excuse me, he... That was his, his entree into the film business. And he, you know, meticulously, methodically, you know, made his way up the ranks in the film business. Um, at a certain point, he became an editor. And then, you know, uh, eventually a, a director, a film director. Yeah. And had a extremely um, proficient career uh, as a film director. He, he won an, an Oscar for, uh, in 1963, for um, best short animated film, something called The Critic that he did with Mel Brooks. Um, he did a documentary with Muhammad Ali uh, in the early 70s called Me, We, um, sort of like an independent film, a documentary, which really, in a lot of ways, set him on his way because after that, he had sort of that entree, uh, th that um, association yeah. with having worked with the greatest, Muhammad Ali. And my dad ended up being known for someone that could work with sports figures and, um, and the like, and ended up being that guy that directed commercials, you know, with Bill Russell and Joe Frazier and Mario Andretti and Meadowlark Lemon, Terry Bradshaw, Willie St I mean, oh like... On and on and on, and my dad went on to have like an incredibly um, vibrant career as as a film director, and got a lot of people into the film business. And I grew up in the film business, wow. um, being on the sets 
of my dad's films. And um, I mentioned Bill Russell. He did that AT&T Bill Russell commercial in the 70s for, for, for Bell Telephone, you know, where, where at the end, you know, he looks into the camera and he, he sinks this hook shot, you know, woo, and uh, kind of a famous commercial. And I, you know, I have pictures of me on the set as got to be a, a nine-year-old or something and um, just grew up in and around the film business. And in doing that, I, uh, as a teenager, I wanted to be an actor and I did um, theater as a teenager. I did some modeling as a teenager. And then eventually um, I went to Emerson College in Boston yeah. to study acting. And it was at Emerson College in, in the summer of 1981 when I went up there is when in the cafeteria, I ran into a guy who had his head shaved. And that was very uncommon back then. Uh, the only people that shaved their heads back then were like um, Marines and psychopaths. Yeah, know? sure, sure. So I ended up talking to him and, and like, what are you into? And he told me he was into this thing called hardcore. And he tried to explain it to me and, and I, I just wasn't grasping it. He said, why don't you just come with me? this weekend to a show. And I went with him to the show and uh, it was uh, in a uh, sort of dilapidated art gallery, art space. And um, there was about 20 other kids there. And uh, the band that was playing, well, was this band called SSD Control. It was their third show they ever played. And I took to it right away because it was young people. And the music that I was into before then was very idol worship. It was like, you know, fans and then looking, you know, at the band up on the stage type yeah. of thing. And um, I just ended up falling in with these guys. And that sort of set me on my path as far as uh, was the really origins of, of my of, of my music career. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. um, so before we continue to go down that path. And I, I could have went on. Like, I could have oh, went yeah, on with that sure. story for an, for a half hour. For but, sure, for sure. But I know we want to steer yeah, yeah. this thing to, to sort of the Bronx stuff. So, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's let's just take a... But that was that arc. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no. That really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, and just a couple questions about your, your mom and dad. Sure. Do you know um, much history about how either side of the family uh, ended up in the Bronx? To sure. With? Sure. So my, my family um, is uh, basically comes from uh, Russia. Sure. You know, um, uh, Russia, um, you know, you could say, uh, you know, Russia, Poland, uh -huh. but the part of Poland was sort of part of Russia and then That's part right. of Poland. So, you know, basically, you know, I come from, uh, I, I have, you know, Russian Jewish roots. Sure, sure, You sure. know, um, they come from the old country. Uh, my father's side came from uh, you know, some part of Russia. Uh, my mother's side came from some part of, of Russia as well. Um, my mother, my mother's family came over here and settled in New Jersey. They had a dairy farm. My, my mother uh, grew up in, 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 in Brooklyn. Okay. You know, my dad's family came here and, you know, he ended up, like I said, in the Bronx and my mother and father met, uh, on Fire Island. Oh, on Fire they met, Island. they met in a bar on Fire Island. Wow. Um, uh, the, a bar called the Bayview, which is now called the Albatross, and it's still there That's fi wild. in Fire Island. They met. They met uh, on Fire Island, and interestingly enough, my sister met her husband in Fire Island as well. <laughs> so these, the, these, this, you know, his, history is cyclical <laughs> in nature. You know, it, it's really kind of, wow. kind of interesting. So yeah, you know, the, 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 those are my roots, and like I said, you know, my dad. You know that part of the Bronx was was really very uh, a, a, a very Jewish neighborhood. You know back then it was Jewish. That's it. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and we're talking you know the forties. That's right. You know, and and just as as a side note, my dad went to Taft High School. Uh huh. And there was another guy that my dad tell, talks about that a friend of his was a cousin of. And my dad says he was always the schmuck with the camera around his neck, right? <laughs> Stanley Kubrick. Oh my God! Stanley wow. Kubrick went to uh, Taft High School in the Bronx, wow. and um, you know, a, a famous guy. And also, if uh, you know, my dad later on getting into the film business and getting into art direction. Yeah. If you ever see, you know, the the the, the soft drink Yuhu, right? The Yuhu colors. My dad, my dad designed the label 
uh, of Yuhu, because uh, early on they were, when they were very, very small, the colors of the Yuhu logo on the Yuhu label, which I believe is like yellow and, yeah, those are the Taft High School uh, colors. Oh, wow. We use this so Yuhu is a, is a Bronx drink. Yeah, it, it sort of, it has a Bronx, it has a Bronx history there, yeah. Because yeah. my dad used to direct the commercials for Yuhu with Yogi Berra. So my dad directed those commercials, and early on when he directed those commercials, Yuhu was a very small regional um, uh, soft drink in, 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 you know, in Florida or whatever, uh, Iroquois brands. Of course, now it was bought up, I don't know, by Pepsi or by this one or that yeah, one. Sure. But yeah, a little bit of, a little bit of, wow. a little bit of history there. Yeah. Wow. And so why don't you talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the different neighborhoods around New York you lived in right. and then... You know, we'll get the spine dive in sure. detail. Sure. So, so I was born. Um, I was born in Forest Hills, Queens. Uh huh. And um, my first couple years were spent in Forest Hills, Queens, which is which you know is still a very nice you know part of of Queens. And then at, at a young age, I guess as my dad was you know really making it, um, he he built a house in Stanford, Connecticut, and I lived in Stanford, Connecticut from um, age four to nine and then my parents split and I ended up we moved into Manhattan when I was uh, nine years old and I lived in Manhattan until I think 12 or 13 at which point we moved up to the Bronx uh, to the Spite and Dival section of the Bronx and um, yeah and then I lived up in Spite and Dival until I went to college at 18. Okay. So I always kind of moved around a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then uh, moving up to to the Bronx, it was um, yeah in the seventies. It, it was it was a uh, it was a uh, it was kind of a listen. Everybody looks back, you know. It was a great era, you yeah, know. Sure, I mean, sure. everybody's youth ha- should be a great era, you know. But um, the, the, where I. This, I lived right next to Kennedy High School. Yeah, you know, um, which has has a really interesting history. Uh, if you look at Kennedy High School, because and I learned this, I learned this later about that whole like kind of area there, like uh, like you know Marble Hill. You know the Marble Hill is still part of Manhattan. Uh huh. Do you know why? Do you know the reason behind that? Because it used to actually be connected. That's right. And all the waterways. Were... That's right. That's yeah. right. So um, so Marble Hill used to be connected to Manhattan because and it was surrounded by kind of swampish right, yeah. but what they did was they cut a, you know the canal to connect the Hudson River and the East River which is where the big Columbia Sea is and then they filled in all the swamp around it uh-huh. well that swamp that they filled in around it that landfill is where they built Kennedy High yep, School that's right that's right as kids we would play down there yeah. And we would always find like stuff sticking out of the ground, weird stuff. And I still have, I still have a um, old telephone, you know, that, that you would hold to the thing, have the receiver. Yeah. We found it sticking out of the ground down there. It wasn't until, you know, many years later, you know, fairly recently that I, that I really read up on the history of it and found out that, you know, the, what was behind Kennedy High School, which was really just like a landfill wasteland. It's the football field now. But when I lived there in the 70s, it was just like this uneven landfill. And we used to go down there as kids and ride our bikes and shoot off SD's rockets. And, and I found this, you know, phone in the dirt and we still have it. I still have it. Um, uh, it it uh, was because they... They they use landfill to fill in it with anything and everything. Yep. So there's all kinds of junk uh, that, that was buried there. And and I lived. We moved right in the building that was right pretty right much across the street. Right, right there. Because um, there's a dividing line there. Kennedy High School, I guess, technically could be in the Kingsbridge section of the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. Something that's right. like and right. and like right on the hill there, the building that I lived in. Uh, was Spite and Dival. Oh, and then farther down, you have Riverdale, uh-huh. and then, of course, Yonkers. Uh-huh. So well, for those who may know, Spite and Dival is when you go up the west side of Manhattan and you go over the Henry Hudson Bridge, the first area there, and it's not very big, it's very small, the first, when you get to the other side of the bridge, that's Spite and Dival. And it, it just is sort of the very tip of the Bronx there. And, uh, you know, we settled up there, 
And um, yeah, it was um, the area then was predominantly um, working class, sure. uh, Irish, very, very mixed Irish, Italian, uh, you know, Jewish, although, you know, you know, although, although you say, yeah, it was Jewish, you know, uh, Jewish is not a, is not a uh, ethnicity. That's right. That's Jewish right. is a religion. So when I say it was it was it was Italian, it was Irish, and it was Jewish. It's like you know, it, 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 I'm, I'm describing a, 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 a religion. But you know, it, it was it was a real mixed bag up there. And then um, and, and growing up there as a teenager, in my formative years as a teenager, when I was hanging out and getting into music and, and uh, dare I say it, you know, experimenting with drugs and uh-huh. learning about girls and, 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 and all that. My friends were a very eclectic bunch because the area was very eclectic. Absolutely. You know, uh, all kinds of, I had all kinds of, you know, different friends. It, 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 I had, you know, uh, I, my, my best friend was from Chile and I had, you know, another friend that was Greek and um, uh, just, just, very, very mixed, which, you know, the area now, uh, I, you know, through the years has changed, yeah, sure, sure. you know, and, and a lot of, from what I see up there, what was once like a, a, a large, like maybe, um, uh, two family home was bought out, tore down. And now there's like a building there. Yeah. So, so, you know, because, because you had houses there that, <clears throat> On some of the main through fairs, like even along the Henry Hudson Parkway or Johnson Ave or, or whatever, or Riverdale Ave or whatever you have you, uh, a lot of those kind of two family houses had like a backyard. Uh-huh. There was a nice um, geographical footprint there, which the houses eventually were sold, were bought out, and there was enough land there to, to build a building. That's right. So that, that's why the whole area has, has changed uh, quite a bit. It has, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and then, you know, I, I went to Kennedy High School, which uh, I went to Kennedy High School in, you know, geez, 78. Wow. Okay. So 78 through 79. 79. Yeah. yeah, yeah I lasted yeah, yeah. about a year, a little, about a year there. Okay. Yeah, but I, yeah, I lived yeah. there for years. Yeah, sure. But, you know, I went to Kennedy for a year and, um, you know, Kennedy was a, was a, uh, <laughs> An interesting place, you know. It was it was a wild place, and um, a bit of a scary place yeah. um, for 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 a young person. Um, it was a just a big big school, you know. Yeah, the classes huge were huge school. back then, you know, 50, 60 people. And, wow. And um, you know, you, you it was like I don't want to go as far as say you know, it was like right. You're going to Kennedy back. It was like going to Rikers Island, you know. But it, it was it was like it was pretty pretty intense you know you you sort of stayed with your group of people and there wasn't a lot of uh cross pollination you know um but as far as the music thing goes up there which which is interesting is that um back then music you were identified in in a big way back then about sort of the music you aligned yourself with you know um you know what are you are you a rock? You know, are you disco? Are you rock? And of course, I was there in that era where you know Saturday Night Fever came out, uh-huh. disco was in, and there was just an ongoing, in lack of a better term, I'll say war between sort of the rock kids and the disco kids. And we would we would have like um, you know, uh um rumbles at, at like at, at lunch or after school where like you know the rock kids with their like denim cut off jack you know led zeppelin you know would 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 you know would brawl with the um you know the tony Mineros of the world with their gold chains and all that and like you know it was sort of like you know throwing rocks at each other and yeah. you know there wasn't i i, I don't I remember a couple of scraps, you know, you kind of run into them and every be some fists and then you pull your people back and scream a lot of taunts. I, I don't recall any, uh, you know, anybody getting, you know, stabbed or, or clubbed or anything like that. They were just, you know. Sure. Um, but one thing I, I do definitely remember is that 
people were closely identified by their musical alignment. And, uh, you know, that, that was a big deal. And um, also, I was going to public high school in the Bronx really when the or when the hip hop thing started. Yeah. Sure. And back then people had boom boxes. This is what people had in the and and, and I don't think it's it's not just the Bronx. Sure. It, this is something that um was widespread, you know, in cities uh, in America and probably around the world, but back then in the Bronx everybody had boom boxes. Uh-huh. People would come to school with their boom boxes. And you know, you'd have people would um, all tune into the same station. So you'd have, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten boom boxes in a semicircle, all tuned into the same thing, and, and people would be like representing. Uh-huh. <laughs> and but I do have a vivid, 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 vivid memory of uh, being on uh, the Bronx, the public transportation, because the MTA would have um, city buses that would come down into Kennedy High School um, to pick kids up when school was over um, and would basically pull out of Kennedy and, and do the route. Whatever the, I forgot what the bus was, but, but it was like, you know, we didn't have school buses. Sure. City buses w- would line up out there and kids that needed it would get on it and then it would like leave Kennedy and go on a route and eventually make it to the subway so kids could get on the subway. But I vividly remember being on the bus and everyone tuning in, like the call would go out, like, you know, uh, you know, 107.5 and everyone would dial it in. And I just remember the whole bus, you know, a hip, a hop, a hip, you know, um, wow. hotel, motel, holiday in. And, it, you know, and that early stuff, that early. Yeah. And I don't know. What would you call that? Would that be hip hop? You know, um, I don't know if it was if it was rap. Uh, uh, hip-hop the word didn't exist that's right yeah you know so but in lack of a better term we could call it the early hip-hop stuff right sure everybody loved it yeah this everybody loved this the rock everybody the rock kids like we loved it yeah and uh everybody loved it and you know everybody was rhyming and it it was it, it was great and it was really special it was a vibrant time and really exciting uh to be a part of uh, the 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 uh, uh, an embryonic musical movement, um, and, you know, it, it was the Bronx. Yeah. You know, it was Kennedy High School, and there was all that early stuff bubbling up, all the early Grandmaster Flash stuff, and all that that was bubbling up. Another thing that I remember about music, interestingly enough, um, because before I went to Kennedy, I went to. Um, I went to PS 141, which was up the hill. Uh-huh. So I went to ju- I went for junior high school. I went to 141. Um, yeah, I went to junior high school 141, and I ended up going to a couple of schools, but but eventually ending up at Kennedy for a while. And uh, one thing I, I really that was really wild about then is a lot of people, a lot of kids my age, regardless of their ethnicity, loved Southern rock. Puerto Rican kids, black kids, white kids, you know, Southern rock. And it was incredible because it, Molly Hatchett, the Outlaws, the Allman Brothers, Leonard Skinner, and even some of the deep, deep stuff like Charlie Daniels Band, you know, Grinder Switch, you know, Blackfoot. And we would, we would hang out in Ewan Park, which is right next to Kennedy. We would hang out in Ewan Park on the weekends and we'd freaking listen to Southern rock. You know, everybody. <laughs> wow. Really interesting. I had like, like you know, uh, serious, you know, African-American friends yeah. that loved Southern rock. Wow. Yeah, really interesting. Do you know if any of the students, I mean, obviously in a place like Chicago, there was a big influx of people from Appalachia right. to Chicago, like around that time, a little before that time. Right. But- I've heard a couple of stories from the Bronx like that, but do you know, were there any kids at high school that, you know, were migrants from, recent migrants from the South even? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, I, I just yeah. think, I, I, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, uh, in retrospect, of course, you know, back then when you're, when you're young, 
you know, you're not really up on That's people's right. sort of uh, fan. Yeah. But um, yeah, I just I just remember fucking Southern rock, man. They you just loved it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it was also you know that era was a very vibrant time for music. Yeah. You know, it was just you know bands and records and we used to go out at, at, at a young age we sneak into clubs a lot we go into the city from the bronx we take the number one train down of course all the way down the number one train and we would go down to the village uh-huh. and like or we'd cut out of school um you know we'd go to the village and we would just wander around the west village down into the East Village and, you know, down 8th Street, you know, where Electric Lady Studio was, um, Jimi Hendrix Recording Studio. You know, we, we would sort of kick it off by smoking a joint in the uh-huh. vestibule. And then we'd wander down 8th Street that had all these incredible, like, head shops and poster shops and record stores. We would just w- go down one side of the street and turn around and just come up the other side wow. of the street. And... Um, that's just, you know, sort of what we did is like young hooligans and, you know, trying to, you know, steal stuff from stores, shoplifting. We'd have a whole thing set up, you know, a couple of us would go in, one guy would distract, you know, and, and, and we would come home with just tons of stuff. We used to just come home with tons and tons of stuff, um, you know, from, from that routine, wow. you know, like just tons of stuff. We had, we had like, we had just tons of stuff. We, we would, we would just... We just we had like a, a, a like a shoplifting crew where we would just go out on these adventures into the city, um, and then you know and and back then, I don't know if the drinking age was lower. I think it might have been eighteen. Yeah. Um, you you know we'd go to Times Square and get a, a fake ID, which would enable us for like at fifteen and sixteen years old, you know we were drinking in bars, uh, uh, you know McSorley's grassroots on St. Mark Street at 15, 16 years old. You know, we, we were drinking in these bars. So, you know, it, it was a, a bit of a, a bit of a different era. But certainly, you know, music, uh, it, it was a very um, exciting time. And sort of a lot of some of the, the music that I really remember um, being huge back then was um, I, I remember... Frampton Comes Alive, Peter Frampton, Uh because that was a huge, huge record, everybody. And then, of course, you know, when Pink Floyd put out The Wall, I think that was 79, 80, you know, we don't need no education, and and Led Zeppelin Uh put out In Through the Outdoor in 1980, huge record. You know, Bad Company was big, Um, you know, like I said, the Southern Rock stuff. Um, And, you know, and I gravitated to... You know, I liked a lot of uh, the um, the '60s stuff. Sure, I loved sure. the Grateful Dead. I loved the Allman Brothers. I loved Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa was huge. Uh-huh. Um, so I gravitated to. This is all before I went got into hardcore and, sure. and punk and all that. So as a, as a young person, 13, 14, 15, 16, you know, Grateful Dead, Allman Brothers, um, and all that kind of stuff. Frank Zappa um, and. And, and and all my friends from 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 the Bronx that loved that stuff too. What about your parents? What kind of music were they listening to in the house? Um, you know, uh, interestingly enough, um, you know, m- my my mother had you know a bunch of eight tracks and stuff like that. But you know, my mother wasn't musically inclined, sure. so music wasn't. You know, there was a couple of things that she had that I thought were cool. You know, she had a Santana. Remember, she had a Santana um, eight-track player, but like music wasn't like really a part of of, of my my household. Sure, uh, sure, I, sure. I, you know, when I lived with my mother, you know, my father, you know, was a, a director in the film business. The music was kind of there, but he wasn't, you know, interesting. Which is interesting because my dad was a bit of a recording artist, and he you know, hung out with the Beatles and stuff. But I th- I think I think that just part of it was in that era. FM music was incredibly um, vibrant. Yeah, yeah. It was like, you didn't have to live in a music household per se. 
Everywhere you went, you heard the radio. You got in the car, the radio. You went over here, the radio. The kids, boombox. kids had boomboxes. Nope. You know what I mean? Like music nope. was just everywhere. Yes. You know, and you uh, if a song and back then you'd have like a song for the summer. Like a song would just, you know, it was that summer song. Sure, you know, I remember sure. Fleetwood Mac Rumors was released over, and it was just all you heard the whole summer, uh -huh. you know, um, and that kind of thing. So a song, you know, we don't need no education, was just everywhere for months. You know, it was it was everywhere. So so yeah, and then you know, I just became um, infatuated. And enamored and infatuated and obsessed with music. Uh -huh. I really did as a young person. I, I became just obsessed with it. I just loved music um, and the idiosyncrasies of it. And, you know, uh, who are they and what are they and where did they come from and, and, and who played on the record and what are the songs saying and who produced it and look at the artwork and connecting the dots. I just became a, a, a super music fan at a very young age. I just was obsessed with music. Absolutely. And, yeah. I, I was going to say, and, you know, there's a, a tangibleness that you would, and, and, you know, folks up until relatively recently experienced with the album liner notes. Sure. And just, it's a completely different experience. You could spend hours pouring well, over that. Well, that was the whole thing. You get records and you look at the artwork and you look at the thank you list. And you see who they thanked. Yeah. And you look at who produced it. And you connect the dots to, oh, that guy also produced this record. Mm -hmm. And you see who plays on, you know, on this record and that record. And I just became you know, absolutely obsessed with music. And, yeah. and I, just, I just loved music. And I, I just did a deep, deep dive into, um, into music. And went to as many concerts as I possibly could go to. I was obsessed with Going to concerts, it was like an obsession. Um, any chance I get, we would go to clubs and sneak in and see music and 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 and, and go to go to concerts. And if we didn't have money, which a lot of times we didn't, we would sneak in, uh -huh, and we uh -huh. became masters, masters of sneaking into the Beacon Theater in New York, Madison Square Garden. I mean, if somebody was playing the Beacon, forget it. <laughs> And we say, yo, what, what are you doing to sneak in the beacon? You know, we we had that down. I mean, we figured out a million ways to get into that place. I mean, because back then it was different. It, it was um, it wasn't like it is now. It, it's like been bought and renovated. Back then, you just bang on the back door. Back then, you just you just you know somebody boosts you up to the to the fire escape and you go up to the top level, which is the very back of the balcony. You pound on the door and somebody. Pops the door and you all get in. Uh -huh. I mean, it was that easy, you know. <laughs> you know, we we so we we did that. Madison Square Garden. You would just take an old ticket stub, put five dollars underneath it, because all the ticket takers at Madison Square Garden back then were all the old timers. Uh -huh. All the old timers that probably worked where my dad went there. You yep. know, they were old timers, and you go up and hey hey, uh, 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 you know, with with, a, with an old stub with a five underneath it, uh, and he would just you. Uh, uh, <laughs> and it was a given. I mean, that's how you would get into these things. It was a given. Wow. So we saw millions of concerts like that, you know, a any chance we could get. And, and I was just obsessed with music. I just, I, w I was just, uh, I just love music. And a lot of the music that, that, that I was really into, uh, a lot of the, um, let's call it electric blues. Sure. You know, uh, Led Zeppelin, uh -huh. Grateful Dead. Um, Eric Clapton, Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones for sure. Okay, so I, I, I loved this music. It wasn't until a little bit later that I sort of took a hard look at it and said, oh, wow. So this song, you know, uh, McKinley Morganfield, who is that? Oh, that's Muddy Waters. Uh -huh. So being so obsessed with music, became a little bit of like an archaeologist and started breaking down like where are these where's this music coming from you know follow and following you know the roots you know down and going okay wow the grateful dead stuff a lot of it, it, it you know is is traditional americana stuff uh -huh. and you know um you know 
you know, who was Woody Guthrie? Uh-huh. You know, who was, you know, Lightning Hopkins? Who was Robert Johnson? So that was my entree. But then I went beneath, you know, the veneer and discovered blues and, and was really, really into blues music. Um, you know, really the roots. I really got into the roots of, um, of music uh, and Americana and, and, and uh, you know, a lot of that played into my later years as being a documentary filmmaker. And, um, you know, that, that's just, uh, I just became uh, really obsessed with, with figuring this stuff out, you know? So, um, I, I, a couple of questions, we'll, we'll take one first. Um, what was the first concert you went to? The first concert I went to, um, I mean, we used to sneak in clubs as, as young, but I, I don't, I, the first concert I went to is when I was, I, I was at a summer camp and they took like the campers to a concert. And uh, it was, um, I saw, it was in Connecticut. They, they took us in the, and I saw Jackson Brown oh, in okay. like 1977, I think. Okay. okay but the first, but. The first concert I went to with my friends from the Bronx really was in 1978. I saw the Marshall Tucker Band at Madison Square Garden. My second concert, same scenario, Madison Square Garden with my friends from the Bronx. We saw the Outlaws and Molly Hatchet. <laughs> okay, yeah, Southern Bronx. In 1979. Yeah. And then oh, I also saw the Grateful Dead, Willie Nelson, wow. and the New Riders of the Purple Sage at Giant Stadium in 1978. Wow. So this is the stuff I was seeing back then, you wow. know, and then I saw the Grateful Dead again and I saw, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. And uh, were you going to like some of the smaller venues around New York at this time? Did yeah. You get a, any of those? A, 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 sure. I mean, I remember in 78, we snuck into, we got, we got into a place called Hurrah, which was a, um, a club on the Upper West Side. And... There was, there was an act on, it was two guys, one guy was at the keyboard, one guy was at the mic, and it was really bizarre, and the reason I remember it, because we made fun of it for so long, for so many years after, it was like two guys, one guy was like hitting the keyboard every now and then, the other guy was just like, you know, out, huh? turned out the band was called Suicide. Oh my God. And, uh, and the <laughs> band that opened up for them that night. Although I do not have any recollection of that. Yeah. Maybe I saw it, but I, I just don't have a recollection of it. Was a band called the Misfits. Oh. Yeah. So, so I did see uh-huh. suicide in 1978. Um, but to us, before I left to go to, to college in 1981 and fell in with the hardcore thing to us, like punk rock was this sort of really Sid Vicious, Sex Pistols, sort of, you know, spit on yourself and vomit on yourself and beat up people on your friends. And so the punk rock thing was sort of, I don't want to say it was over our heads, sure. but it just wasn't really on our radar screen. Sure, we, sure. When the Sex Pistols came out, I had the record, I knew it. It was just, we, we used to like... We used to do this thing. We used to get rowdy to it. We'd put it on. We'd put it on, turn out the lights, and like beat the shit out of each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we didn't really kind of, we slash I didn't really understand the, um, the sort of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Culturally, how, you know, the Sex Pistols came about and how important they were and how really, in a lot of ways, some of the stuff that I was into at the time was really getting a bit stagnant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was a young person. Sure. I, I didn't see it that way. I, you know, I wasn't. Sure. To me, a lot of those bands were, were, were. I was just listening to them for the first time. Yeah. It wasn't until, in retrospect, later that you know, being a bit of a historian um, and documentarian, that I sort of saw the timeline and that those bands like The Who and Led Zeppelin and Rolling Stones. The Sex Pistols was a reaction to that and absolutely a legitimate, viable reaction to yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think what is easy to forget from, um, you know, our perspective today is, you know, those albums, like you mentioned, like a huge, 
there were huge albums coming out in the late seventies and yeah. and eighties from these bands, and you know now when the story is told, those albums sometimes become little footnotes. I mean, same thing happens with Black Sabbath. Sure, too. sure, yeah, and and um, at the time those were huge records, huge yeah. records. You know, uh, Pink Floyd, The Wall, and uh-huh. and um, the Who. Oh, the, you know, the Who. Um, I remember. Uh, you know, it was the last one before Keith Moon died. Um, who's Who are you? These were huge records. Yeah. You know, at, at, at the time. You know, in our world. But but yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, why don't you talk some more about um, you know I guess your decision to go to Boston? What led sure. to that? And all yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, I had a fantasy about being an actor. Yeah. Um, I uh, did modeling and, and theater at, you know, camp. You know, I was in uh, West Side Story. Uh, and, you know, I did other theater stuff, modeling stuff. And like I said, I grew up in and around the film business. So, you know, I sort of had a belief that, well, listen, you know, I was, I was a... I was a immature, fairly irresponsible young teenager. Let's be fr- hey, let's be frank here. I was an irresponsible, um, you know, uh, in, very immature young teenager who put a big value on hanging out with his friends, smoking pot, and listen and, and music. Yeah, you know, um, I wasn't very focused. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but you know, as I was. Going through high school, um, you know, what was I going to do with myself? I sort of gravitated to acting and being yeah. an actor. And I did, I got into Emerson College. I was very fortunate that, that, that I, um, I did pretty good on the SAT test. Um, I, did, I didn't, you know, do amazing, yeah. but I did pretty good. And then sort of my, my background doing some acting and this and that and, and, and probably my father being a director certainly helped with me getting into Emerson College. Sure, sure. Um, to study acting. Sure. I went up to Emerson College. I thought it was going to be easy. Yeah. I thought I was going to be the next James Dean. <laughs> I thought I was going to be the next Jack Nicholson. All I have to do is just act. You know, Jack Nicholson doesn't act. He just acts like himself. I just thought I was going to be cool. How could they resist, you know? So I get up to Emerson and... It's like a major league shock, you know. Um, you know, first off, being a freshman back then, living in the dorm, uh, in a dorm, it was just wild. Yeah. Um, and I look back now at the photos of us. It was like there's like alcohol in every photo. There's like a big bong in every photo, <laughs> and like this is living in the dorm. Yeah. I don't think you could do that in this day and age. Yeah. You know. You know. You know. Booze. Marijuana smoking devices, like in the dorm, yeah. um, out in the open. Yeah. Um, people would, and I had a couple friends, I had, I had one in particular who came up and went to Emerson as well, you know, from New York, basically showed up and just partied out and partied the way out of school in like one semester. Like barely was partying so hard, couldn't even wake up to go to classes, couldn't even deal with it, just just partied out. So it was tough. Um I, I, school was tough. I couldn't, um, way tougher than I thought. Uh, extremely competitive. Yeah. Emerson was very competitive. It was, it was, I think, Emerson, if I remember correctly, was like, let's say, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll be conser- I'll, I'll play a conservative here. Let's say it was 55% girls, 45% male, and of the 45%, Probably at least ten to fifteen percent were gay uh, see, at the I time. See, I see. So, um, which sort of put me in in like a it was sort of a weird and very competitive. Yeah, very competitive. So it was the the environment was a little like wow, you yeah. know, um, and very competitive. Sure, very competitive. The theater part of it, yeah. which I was just not. Um, ready to deal with. Yeah. Um, I did, it was just, uh, so, but, but what happened with me was I went to my first hardcore show uh-huh. and it, my whole life went, woo. I connected with a scene 
this incredibly young, it was a youth movement. And um, I got into, uh, I was part of the original Boston hardcore scene. Yeah. I was part of that Boston crew. There was 10 of us in the beginning. And I was in the room when it happened. Wow. I was there. Yeah. I know every every other kid that was in the room. You know, there was, there was, there was 20, 25 of us at the time, you know. Um, and I was there and, and it felt special and it felt important and, it, and, and, and it was exciting. Yeah. So it was very hard for me to go to 11th grade and sit in a frigging classroom and be told about, you know, certain things. Yeah. Um, I got frustrated after a while. Um, I was, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't focus and, um, my mind was elsewhere. I, I, I got into a band and, and that and I also, I, I didn't want to waste my dad's money. Yeah, for sure. You know, if you're not, you know, I, I, I love my dad and, and um, my family. And it became obvious, you know, I gave it, you know, you know, uh, uh, first semester, second semester. But when it came time for the third semester, I think the next year, I, I said, you know what, Pop? It's not happening. Yeah. You know, so I ended up uh, leaving school. And I lived up there till the end of sort of the, the, the school year. And then I moved back to New York. I see. And then started, you know, started a whole something different, you know, something in New York, which, you know, is incredibly interesting because for me, job always meant something in the film business. Sure. And back then, uh, it was basically like I worked in movie equipment rental houses. And I learned to drive, you know, big trucks at a young age, you know, pulling the trucks in and out and jockeying them around and fixing lights and, 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 and putting together, you know, orders like you know, so here's an order, you know, six of these lights, five of those lights, sandbags, stands, this and that. So at a young age, job to me always was something in the film business. Yeah. So I was, you know, working in a movie equipment rental house, doing deliveries in the van. Hey, this film shoot, you know, in the Bronx needs this, this, and this. I drive the van there and drop it off. So I came back to New York and I had a job in a movie equipment rental house and I started another, I started another band. And the hardcore thing, I was still very, very new and very fresh and exciting. I came back to New York in 1983. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, um, I, 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 and I, I had some friends in New York already because when I was in Boston, we would come down and, oh, and we would I cross pollinate. Sure. Sure. Um, SSD Control, the band that, that, that I was pretty much affiliated with, would come down and play A7 and, and, and would play CBGBs or whatever. And that's how we met, you know, guys in Bad Brains uh -huh. and, 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 and the guys in Agnostic Front and so on, you know, and then later the Cro-Mags guys, sure, sure. so on and so, so forth. So when, so when I moved down here, I would go, I, I still, I, I made some friends. So I wanted to start another band and I decided to start a band. And what I did was I recruited my friends from the Bronx. Okay. And I recruited some of my friends from Kennedy High School. Yeah. Because when we were young teenagers, before I sort of went off to Boston and was baptized, you know, you know what I mean? Like I, I, we were all part of this thing. So yeah, rock, right. rock and roll, this and that. And then I go away and I, and I get wrapped up in this thing and then I come back yeah. and it's like, okay, this is what we're doing. And, and did, did you have your, your head shaved pretty much from the get go? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you probably came back and they're like, who are you? Well, and, well, I, I would come back okay. periodically yeah. and, and, and. Did stuff with them periodically, and and um, they sort of knew what was going on. But when I came back for, for for good, it was like, okay, this is what we're doing. This thing's called hardcore, and this is like what it is. And so I I, I basically took out of my my best friends. Okay, you you know you, you play bass. You're a bass player. You're a guitar player. Okay. You're the, you're, you can kind of play drums. Okay. And cause you know, a big part of the hardcore ethos was, you know, get up, get out and make it happen. Yeah, sure. And then anybody could be a part of it. So there was a real, um, 
uh, enthusiasm uh, to do something. Yeah. Not necessarily start a band. If you weren't going to start a band, you would start a fanzine, or you would be a photographer, or you would promote shows. Uh -huh. so, th so it was a very inclusive youth movement. Yeah. It was room on the boat for everybody back then. It was a real us against them mentality. So I start this band and, uh, called The High and the Mighty. And I write all the songs on an acoustic guitar and I show it to the guys. Some of them took to it easier than others. Okay. Some of them, you know, one guy, one guy totally got it. Yeah. Jumped in, shaved his head. And, you know, I spent a lot of time with him and going to shows and whatever. One guy sort of was in the middle with it. He didn't not get it. He was, he was, he was up for it. But, you know, he wasn't, you know, and we have one guy that kind of just never got it. Uh, the guitar player just never really got it. Um, and it became a little bit of a problem down the line. You know, uh, see, he just sort of didn't really get it. So it was always a struggle to, to, to you know, with him. It was always a struggle all, all along the way. He didn't really practice and, and when we weren't rehearsing. And so we start the High and the Mighty. Our first show was at CBGB's. Um, on a bill with my friend HR from Bad Brains, uh -huh. set it up. Um, you know, we went on it like, you know, God, it was really late. You know, it was the first High and the Mighty show. And um, it was, uh, you know, all the usual suspects at the time. HR, Murphy's Law, Cause for Alarm. You know, we were on the bill. And then after that, we started playing A7, which was an old uh, dilapidated storefront on Avenue A and 7th Street that originally was Mary's Candy Store in the 60s and was an after-hours place. It opened up at midnight. Uh -huh. We played A7 a lot. Yeah. Hi, the High and Mighty played A7 a lot. Um, we loved it there. It was like our Madison Square Garden. Yeah. It was a big deal to us. And, um, you know, I, it, lasted, uh, it lasted not even two years yeah. of the High and the Mighty. Things, you know, things back then, you know, seemed... You know, a summer felt like 10 years, Yes. you know, um, nowadays the summer's gone in the blink of an eye, yeah. you know, um, at, at what happened was doing shows down there with, with the high and the mighty. And we'd come down from the Bronx. I'd come up here and, and, and I, I, I get, you know, I, ha I had a van, you see, so I'd come up here and I do the rounds. I, I'd, I'd go up, you know, I'd, I'd go down to, uh, to Bailey Ave and get Nick, the bass player, and I get Rodrigo, you know, up up on Palisades Ave, and I get Ozzy. I do the rounds to pick up the guys. We go down to A7, and we would park in front of A7, and it was like downtown Beirut back then. It was just <laughs> dangerous and scary. And we would sit in the van like for hours and hours. The shows, God, sometimes you wouldn't go on till like three, four in the yep. morning. I remember going on at four thirty in the morning. You know, God. But it was from doing those shows. You know, I made a lot of um, lifelong friendships with sure. people, including Roger Moret from Agnostic Front, Vinny Stigma from Agnostic Front, you know, Jimmy G from Murphy's Law. Um, and I met a couple of people. And, you know, one of them, one, one person I met was uh, the guitar player uh, who played an antidote. Uh -huh. And then, you know, when they, uh, we would play shows together, both bands. And when they fell out and had a split with their original singer, I ended up joining Antidote. Uh -huh. So then I left the high and I joined Antidote. So um, then I was in Antidote for, for a long time. So um, an interesting thing to note is that for making, for meeting all these people in different bands and doing shows with people in different bands, like I said, you know, I always had a job in the film business. Yeah. And a couple years after that, I was a stage manager on a film stage in Manhattan, 3G's studio. I, I, um, I was a stage manager and had a lot of great, you know, production companies come through. I was basically the liaison for, the, you know, the stage and if a production company wanted to come in. Sure. Did a lot of great stuff in there, um, you know, music videos. And this is right as the golden age of music video is ramping up. And because I was working in, in, the, in the film business, which at the, which at the, which at the, uh, at the time, was it like like a medieval fiefdom? Yeah, sure. It's not like now where you go to New York uh, Film School Academy and you get in the film business. Very difficult to get into the film business back then. Yeah. You had to know somebody. 
You know, it was very difficult. It was a, it was very closed, very difficult. Um, and I ha so from I had someone approach. So so I met a lot of people. Well, Chromax. Harris Mayhew. For Harris sure. Mayhew approaches me one day and says, "Hey, man, I got this band asking me to do a music video for them. I don't know how to put it together. Do you want to put it together? I'll direct it, and you like put it together, produce yeah, it." Yeah produce it. And um, before that, my boss said, hey, anytime you rent the equipment outside the building, I'll split it with you. So I was doing these little jobs and I scraped together enough money to incorporate. I, I created Stone Films NYC, which my, was my production company. And right about the time he asked me about this video, he, um, I, I cobbled together enough money to make the first payment on an insurance policy, which as a film production company in New York City, you had to have this million dollar insurance policy so you could get a permit from the city and you could rent cameras from camera rental houses and stuff. One of those moments in life where a lot of the stars lined up. Yeah. He comes to me about this band. I said, sure, you know, we get going on this video. The, the, the band turned out to be a band called Biohazard. The video ended up being a band called, uh, uh, the video ended up being for a song called Punishment. Ends up being, you know, a, a really ground, groundbreaking video. Plays on Headbangers Ball 14 weeks in a row. Biohazard is managed by Rush Management, which is Russell Simmons and those guys. They have a musical act called Onyx, who had a song called Slam. Somebody over there had the insight to say, let's get the rock and roll white boys to do the video. Yeah. We do the video for Onyx Slam. It goes to number one on MTV and, and you know, we're off and running and just had like an incredible career for a couple years uh, doing that. So I, I, so sort of uh, the point I'm making is that it was those connections in the community and the culture that I made uh -huh. as a very young person, the roots, the roots go deep from, you know, um, being in the high and the mighty and playing with other nobody, nothing bands at the time and, and connecting with these people that, you know, I, I created these friendships and these alliances that later, you know, pe you know, played out in, into these, in, in, into, into my career, really. Wow. wow. Yeah, yeah. And it goes on and on from of there. Course, I mean, it's course. like this and that and, you know, this guy and that guy and, you know, I could I could go on and on about the people I met, you know, Ditto Montiel at the A7, who's a Hollywood director now, Jesse Mallon from Whitestone, Queens, who had heart attack, who, who you know, has all these clubs now and, and, who, was, and who I'm involved with now. And, like, it, it was really a, a big part of, uh, of, of who I am, yeah. So as far as the High and Mighty goes, um, uh would you all play shows outside of New York, or were you only playing shows in New York? You we play. We, we the high and the mighty. You know, there was a it was um, a tough network back then. Yeah, you know, it yeah, was very. Yeah, yeah. It was. You know, I know a lot of bands. You know, you have some band. You know, bands that you know went out. But as far as in New York, you know, uh, uh, not a lot of bands really. You know, got out. Right. Um, Agnostic Front was really like the first one yeah. that like really went out and did it. Uh, but the High and the Mighty played a lot of shows in New York, and and you know we played you know let's call it the tri-state area, yeah, right? Sure, and, sure. and beyond that, we we opened for we we went and opened for the Misfits in uh, in Boston, okay. uh, one of their last shows they played yeah. uh, with Glenn Danzig in 1983. Uh, High and the Mighty opened for the Misfits at the Channel. Uh, we played you know Jersey with Agnostic Front at the Showplace. We played down in D.C. you know with with um, with Scream and, and, and a couple others. Um, you know, we, 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 we did these, you know, Lewis and Clark expeditions yes. every, every now and then. Um, but for the most part, it was, it was, um, New York, you know, five boroughs. And back then, you know, there was a lot of gigs in like really crummy places, oh, of course. like places that were like, you know, you know, we're playing like some, you know, you know, abandoned, you know, squad or storefront, yeah. you know, we played a lot of. You know, but we did play A7 a lot. We played CBGBs um, and a lot of places that were around for a month or two or, or you know, a month or two. Years. And, you know, in retrospect, one of the regrets I have, and I, and I like having regrets. You know, my regrets have served me well. Uh, you know, I enjoy, I've learned to savor my regrets. Um, 
is that by hook or by crook, we, we, we didn't um, print up the high and the mighty recording we did. Because anybody from that era that printed up a record, those things are just looked upon as defining Absolutely. moments. And in 1983, we did a great recording. We printed up some demo tapes. We used it to get shows. And then I got, and then I got, I joined Antidote. I, I kind of jumped, I, I jumped, you know, from one lily pad to, to the next one. Sure. And in retrospect, I really, really regret somehow doing, what, you know, whatever it took necessary, begging, borrowing, stealing, the money to print up, you know, 500 records. Yeah. Of course, it came out years later. You know, people look at it as sort of, you know, a, a great moment. But it's just a shame we didn't get that recording out. It really would have changed things in a certain regard. On the other hand, I'm sitting here right now. Things played out the way they did. It's like that Star Trek episode. You know, you go back and change one thing, you wouldn't be sitting here right now. Right. I'm very happy with the way my life turned out. Uh, you know, I, I, I have a great life and I'm very grateful for that. So, but, you know, I do regret that not getting its just desserts and being out there, you know, uh, being one of the releases, you know, from that initial wave of New York hardcore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, this is uh, going to be a, a, a relatively obscure question, but but I'll be interested to, to hear the answer. Sure. Probably no, but did... The High and the Mighty ever play any shows in the Bronx that you remember? And I ask that because I'd have to go back and look at my notes, but I know there was a band in the scene at the time, but the High and the Mighty, of course, but that played in St. Mary's Park, maybe in 85, mm. with um, uh, Africa Bombada. Yeah. It's the only hardcore show I've, I've right. heard about being in the Bronx of that era. But You know, honestly, me. there was no place to play That's in the right. Bronx. Yeah. It just didn't exist. Yep. There was no place. Yeah. It didn't, I mean, maybe there's something, so, but there was no, I mean, the, we're talking 1983. Mm -hmm. People he, didn't know what it was. That's right, that's right. People, people didn't know what it was. That's right. So, you know, where would you play in 83? Yeah. A7, you know, Brooklyn had a, I remember Brooklyn, there was always like some loft or some weird place or, you know, you know, I remember playing in Manhattan and some like old movie theater that, that was like going to be torn down, yeah. you know, like there was no like venue or place. I know later on in the Bronx, things happened, especially yeah. like in the nineties, That's right. you know, there was, really you know, uh, you know, in the nineties, a, a couple things and, and the next sort of generation of bands District 9, um, Fahrenheit, yep. uh, Billy Club, stuff like that. Those guys sort of, you know, you know, a, a lot of times in music culture, there's a baton that gets passed from the people that started to the next people to the next people. And then it gets to the third person and it's just more out there and, and easier. But I don't think we played the Bronx because there was no place no to play. Place to play. It right. just didn't exist. Yeah. It, it, it didn't exist. You know what we would do? What we would do back then for our Bronx friends, we would rent the biggest rehearsal room, which was like seven bucks an hour. Because okay. because in Manhattan, you had a real bunch of rehearsal, bunch sure. of them. There was like, they're long, long gone. Yeah. But, you know, in 83, there was these rehearsal buildings. And there was one place in particular called Joe Sandra. It was a dump. It was a dump and we would rent like the biggest room and we would invite like all our friends yeah. and like 15, 20 of our friends from the Bronx would show up. They'd all bring six packs and you know, they let you smoke reefer in there yeah. and it would just be like, that would be like a gig and we would just, we'd run through a set for our friends and, and, and people they would invite and then we'd take a break and party and then do it again. So there, there just wasn't a place That's in the right. Bronx to play. That's right. You know, I mean, it just didn't, it just didn't exist. You know, I mean, even me, I mean, even just, just from where I'm standing, right. From where, where I, you know, I don't remember a lot of music 
then seeing a lot of music right. in the Bronx in, in, in the 70s. I know for the kind of music I was into before my time, Gaelic Park yes. on Broadway. Black Sabbath played there. Black Sabbath played there. The Grateful Dead played uh -huh. there. The Jefferson Airplane played yep. there. They had a bunch of shows, which is interesting because when I was growing up in that area, I remember walking by there and just fantasizing, being yeah, like, I know. like, wow, could you imagine? Saturday. And it's very cool that, that, you know, it's on the number one line. And, um, but, you know, and I remember kids in the high school, you know, um, having a rock band and playing like we had, you know, keg parties out in the woods, you know, in the Bronx in certain places. But, you know, I, I just don't remember, you know, venues, you know, the, the stuff we were doing, the stuff the High and the Mighty was doing, which, you know, you know, dare I say it was like first wave of American hardcore. Yeah, sure. To me, first wave of American hardcore is, you know, very beginning, whatever it is, you know, it's like 79 to 83. That's right, it's yeah. the first wave, you know. Yeah. And we caught the tail end of that. It just, it just wasn't a place to to play. Yeah. In the Bronx, you know. Did you, uh, did you know of other um, bands or musicians that had, you know, some type of Bronx connection during that era? I mean, Paris Mayhew's from the Bronx um, originally. Yeah. Um, I I don't I remember when he moved out, but yeah. No. Um, Not really. There's one band that I'm curious if you ever had any run-ins, and I think they go. I, they might. It might be '84 when they go back to. But the unjust. Did you ever? I, I'm that? familiar with the name yeah. of the band. I yeah. don't know the. I don't. I don't know the band. I. I know. I. I. You know. I. I I'm familiar with the name of the band. Sure, sure, sure. I see it in the. In the. In the. In the. In the in this, in the, uh, in this, in in the, in the scrolls. You know, I see it in the historical scrolls, but I just don't. Remember, like other bands going, "Yo, we're from the Bronx," that's right, that's you know. Right. And they, they might not have even said it at the time, anyway. Even if they were, you know, I mean. Yeah. Well, 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 you know, for me, like I said, I went to Kennedy in the '70s. Yeah. Then went, and then when I started the High and the Mighty, I wasn't living in the that's Bronx right. per se. That's right. I had friends in the Bronx, and we were kind of in this corner. You know, where, where we were from was in this kind of corner of the Bronx. Right. We weren't in the South Bronx, that's right. and you know, and we weren't. Hispanic by nature, sure. so I know. I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of the guys that 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 I know, hardcore guys, the Billy Club Sandwich guys, or, or uh, the, the, you know the um, the, the uh, District Nine guys, those guys uh, going back to their community and their culture, you know, it was very musically vibrant, yeah, and yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. In, in their culture, you know, we lived in this little corner of the Bronx that was sort of like this weird melting pot, you know. One guy in the High and Mighty was from Chile. One guy was Greek. One guy was, I think, Italian. Yeah, yeah. And like, I'm like Russian, Russian Jewish, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure. So this was the little corner where we lived, which was this, where, where, we, where we were from, which is sort of like the Kingsbridge, Spite and Dival corner, you know? Uh -huh. It's really that corner of the Bronx, you know? And um, yeah, so. We didn't really have a, a, a lot of, which is years later to see that, you know, the Bronx had a bit of a renaissance yeah, yeah, when yeah. it came to heavy and hard music. It's very cool. Yeah. Very yeah. cool indeed. For sure. Yeah. yeah I love it. You know, yeah. you came in the era where, you know, now, now the oral, some of the oral histories with folks from, um, you know, from the era and a little after you came from, like, they might have been from the Bronx, but they didn't know of any other yeah. people you know, yeah. in the Bronx that were really into it. Yeah. Other than their own circle. Um, for, sh for sure. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so um, do you want to talk a little bit about your time with um, with Antidote? I know you were with them a long time. Right? Yeah. And, and you still, you still I, are, right? See, I mean, no, no. Incendiary, incendiary device, yeah. The, the uh, let me see. Device, right? if I touched on all my notes. Yeah, yeah, I touched on all my notes. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I there was like a, a, a progression you know, it was like when I was in Boston, you know, that whole thing. I had a band called the Mighty CEOs for a minute, then came back and started the High and the Mighty. And then, you know, I just loved the band Antidote. Yeah. Um, they were my favorite band. And we played shows with them and I became very close with the guitar player. And when they split with their singer, I ended up joining. And, um, you know, I was in Antidote for, for a bunch of years uh, until we put it to rest in, in 92. And then we kind of resurrected it in 2008, many years later. And um, Antidote kind of ran its course. 
and we, from sort of the ashes of Antidote, some of the members that you know still really wanted to play, we 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 started Incendiary Device, and that's just been a really joy. Yeah, it's yeah. been a joy. Um, I'm playing music again with people that um, that that I like and and love playing music, and you know we're hot out of the gate. Uh, you know, our record, you know, came out fairly recently on Bridge Nine Records, and uh, it's um, it's a bit of a new beginning. And, and the antidote thing was tough because it was a bit of an albatross around my neck because I joined a band that had just put out, you know, uh, an incredible seven inch, uh, and, and what's turned out to be an iconic seven inch, and I don't sing on it. Yeah. So yeah. I was always kind of looked upon as that guy, you know. Oh, you you sang on that? No, I didn't. You know, and, and it was it was tough, man. You know, we tried to blaze our own path. Antidote, we had different influences. You know, we got we, we did like the rock record. You know, we grew our hair long and did the rock record, which you know didn't go over well. You know, you know, you know, you know if you love that record, you love that record. If you don't like that record, oh god, forget it. So you know, I kind of dragged that around for years, and still, they're still hey, look at this, and it's like, all right. We had long hair and we did a rock record. Um, but it, um, that hand really played out. Um, I don't want to begrudge anybody that, sure. that, that it's just not my style. Uh, but we just grew apart. Yeah. And uh, it just got kind of crummy. And then the guys in the band that, you know, were still into it and you know, wanted to move forward. We moved on for a sec for, for a while there. We tried to rebrand ourselves as a version of Antidote, yeah. but that was just met with you know a lot of um, hysterics and drama. Sure. And the day and and we 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 had new songs, and one of the songs was a song named Incendiary Device, and we thought you know what, let's uh, oh, oh what happened was the guitar player went and got the original singer, and they started playing shows, so there was like two Antidotes out there, and they kind of ran afoul. Of, of some, you know, situation, and it was all this stuff on, on social media, and we were like, oh, God. So we decided, you know what? We're out. Yep. Let's reinvent ourselves, rebrand ourselves as incendiary device. Walking away, no more antidote. We came up with a whole bunch of new songs, and we, we just relaunched it. Yeah. And it's just been fantastic. It's, it's really fantastic because uh, um, it's really, for me, it's... Um, music that I can sing really well because all the songs are written for me. I'm not singing something somebody else that, from an old record that I didn't sing initially. Yeah. I really wouldn't have sang it that way, you sure. know. So now we're doing something that uh, we all we we're all we all love, and it's just been a joy, you know. It, it's been really great. I love it. Yeah. Some of the I think the Incendiary Device record is is the best thing that I've ever done, and I know a lot of people say that, but I think. As a vocalist and vocally, it's the best thing I've ever done. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, um, so a, a couple of things that I, I want to ask you about yeah. um, all of the work on music videos you've done. Sure. Let's talk about um, Eric B and Rockham first. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So um, when I was uh, so I was a uh, I came up you know in the golden age of music video. It was an incredibly exciting and vibrant time. Yeah. Uh, to to be doing this stuff. And um, I was working in a movie equipment rental house, and I was a stage manager at Riverview Studio in Astoria, Queens. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And um, a production company that used to come through there, uh, the director was a guy named Scott Calvert. Yeah. Now, Scott Calvert, later on, after all this, he went on probably, you know, some of the biggest stuff that he did, he directed a video for... Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch called Good Vibrations. Uh -huh. He's also the guy that directed the Basketball Diaries. He's the one that casted Mark Wahlberg in the Basketball, insisted, because yeah. he did the Good Vibrations video, said, I want this kid in the film I'm directing, the Basketball Diaries with Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh -huh. Before all that, he was a music video director, slogging it out. And he had a production company, I believe... Was it Classic Concepts? And they came and shot on my stage quite a bit. They came in and did um, a couple of times. You know, I got to know them. And they, at a certain point on the weekends, they'd ask, hey, do you want to 
work on one of these videos? Do you want to be a second AD, which is a second assistant director? Yeah. You have the director, you have the assistant director, and the second AD, you're sort of running around getting the talent. Hey, we're, we're ready for you, you know, uh -huh. that kind of stuff, you know? And the first video that we did was a group called Eric B and Rakim, and it was, it was, uh, 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 Called, uh, the song was called Follow the Leader. And then after that, we did Eric B. Rakim, Microphone Fiend. And this was early on in the hip-hop game, right? This was, this was pretty early on. Uh, and, um, you know, what I remember about it was they were the real deal. Absolutely. They were the real deal. I mean, you kind of had these sort of like gumball rappers like, you know, uh, you know, people in the back say, ho, oh! you know, and then you had Eric B and Rakim. Yeah. That shit was real. Yeah. And um, deadly serious. Yeah. Like those guys walked around, you know, Eric B walked around with a lot of gold on, carrying a baseball bat, and with a lot of really thug characters surrounding him. Um, I thought they, I thought Rakim was, you know, really the, the, Premier rapper, I thought he was incredible. Yeah, um, probably my my favorite. You know him and and uh, Joe uh, Reverend Run. For you sure, know for sure. uh, him and and who who I worked with. You know we, you know me and Paris Mayu did a Run DMC. Ooh, what you gonna do video later? But you know Rock Kim w was incredible, and uh, working on those videos w w were really intense. Um, they were sort of the precursor to like the Wu Tang Clan, like yeah, with that sure. sort of. Um, uh, aura of of, 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 of of chaos, hostility, and violence around them, <laughs> you know? And there was always, like, something like, you know, somebody getting fucked up, beat up, or, you know, something crazy. But, yeah, that, that was an incredible, that was incredible. And those those two videos are iconic. Absolutely. And I'm just, you know, just proud and thrilled that, that, that I could be a part of them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know, I know you have been involved in many, 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 many music videos over yeah. the years, but I wanted to Especially Please ask you about any that. any of them you could ask me. You know, I have yeah. fond memories of, of 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 all of them. You know, but that that one was it was really incredible. Like I said, there's the trajectory of Scott Calvert, who did those. And you know what else? And what else? Another one that he did in the stage where I was the stage manager was Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Parents don't understand. And I vividly remember opening up the roll up garage door for a passenger van to come in because the, t the, the group, the talent were from Philly uh -huh, uh -huh. and they pulled in. I, I still remember it like it was yesterday. And the, uh, there was an older gentleman driving and it was the father. He was, he was driving his son, um, uh, Will Smith yeah. and their crew, their posse, they drove from Philadelphia and they pulled in, and that's when they did the Parents Don't Understand video, uh -huh. right right on my stage. And wow. Scott Calvert directed that as well. And then he went on to do some real big ones. You know, he did, um, you know, Marky Mark was huge, and Cindy Lauper, and Meatloaf, and this and that. But then he went on to direct, like I said, uh, The Basketball Diaries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Incredible. Um, and as far as... Far and as the whole thing was chaos. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, no, but, but like... That era of music videos, the golden age of music videos, was really chaos because I remember in, in that stage, and, and I don't remember which one of his videos it was specifically, but I remember going to go into the electric closet to pull the bull switch to turn the power on, and his gaffer or his, or his cameraman was in there smoking crack. <laughs> you know, they were out the whole night before partying. There was always drugs, and they, they would smoke grass openly on the set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, the cocaine wasn't out in the open. Yeah. But, like, that, like, the, the, the music videos, the reason that those music videos went, you know, 24 hours was because, you know, they, they, they were fucking on drugs. They were, they were coked up, and, and they were smoking pot the whole time. There was alcohol on the set, and... As a producer, when you do the numbers, you go, okay, well, this is a two-day shoot. Yeah. But then if you go, well, if you make it a one long-day shoot and buy everybody out on a 20-hour day, you could almost do it cheaper. 
So they would do these friggin' literally 24 hour shoots, man. And they were, they were friggin' like in the end, people were, were delirious. I, bet. I mean, because you'd be working the next day, the sun's up and they're still, they're, they're doing the last shot, but then it would be done, you know? Oh my God. And that was one of many, man. That it was, I worked on a lot. I worked on a lot in the capacity as stage manager and sure. assistant director and production assistant. And then, you know, when I connected with Paris Mayhew, I owned the production company. Uh -huh. And then after I split with Paris, I went on to a whole other career directing and producing them myself. And did Agnostic Front uh -huh. Gotta Go and the two Madball videos and Sub-Zero and Fury of Five and so on and so forth. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Of, of all of the hardcore music videos that you've shot, you know, I mean, this might be a hard question to answer, but, but what are some of the ones that you know, stick with you the most as far as... It's not a hard question. It's been asked many times. Okay. And the ones that, 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 the ones that stick with me have stuck with me. Yeah. So the, the ones that, that still resonate for me, and, 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 when, and when, I, when I see them still, like the hair on the back of my neck still stands up, like it was yeah. magic. Yeah. Um, not necessarily in this order. Yeah. Biohazard Shades of Grey. Sure, sure. Which was just incredible. I mean, Biohazard Punishment was very special, yeah. but something about the next one we did, Biohazard Shades of Grey, was so gritty, so street, so captured the moment that that, that one, um, another one is Onyx Slam. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It was just an incredible moment, and, 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 and a lot of things came together. It was like the rock and roll white boys and the hottest you know, rap track of the moment, bam! Uh -huh. And then it went to number one on MTV. Uh -huh. So just the 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 excitement uh, surrounding that yeah. and having you know that moment of like oh yeah you know like we've reached the promised land you know it, it's 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 really great um, that, that, that that's really and then I always you know uh, I um, the Madball video that I directed Down by Law yeah. which was the first Madball video ever which I shot and directed myself using the leftover pieces of film from the big music videos that I did with Paris. Like when we did, like we, back then everything was shot on film. Yeah. And if you don't use the whole re, the whole um, uh, roll of film, yeah. you, have, you end up with what's known as a short end. Like let's say it's a 400 foot load of film, you use 200 feet of it, the cameraman downloads the other 200 feet of it. It's still good, and, 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 and you keep it in your refrigerator. And I ended up having all these short ends, and I approached Mabo. I said, yo, because it was Roger's little brother. Yeah, and I was sure. like, yo, I want to do a video for your band. They were like, what? They had no idea. So I ended up doing that video. They trusted me to do it. It was their first video. And that video, Down by Law, Mabo, was the first video. It's it still, when I see it, it's so grimy. It's so gritty. Um, it, it, it's, it's one of my, one of my specials. And then, you know, th th there's so many other ones that resonate strongly. Typo negative black number one sure, was sure. really big. Um, run DMC, who, what you going to do? That uh -huh. was huge. The insane clown posse chicken hunting oh, that we yes. did in Detroit. Like that was a <laughs> incredible wild adventure, you know, doing a video, you know, when they sent us the, pa like, you know, back then, you, you, you would get solicited to do a music video. Yes, yeah, sure. uh, A music, uh, the, the record label would send you a package and go, hey, um, do you want to put in a, a, a treatment for this? Yeah. And we get the treatment. We look at it. We're like, what is this? Yeah. Like clowns? It was like, what? Like rapping clowns? I thought it was like like Weird Al Yankovic. I thought it sure. was like a joke thing. Sure. Until we found out what the budget was. And then we sort of like, yeah, okay. And we did, <laughs> and we did it. And... Uh, that was wild. That was a wild one. You know, King's X, Dogman we did. That, that, was, um, that was great. Um, and then some of the, the, the smaller hardcore videos, you know, Fury of Five, Do or Die, Sub-Zero, Higher Power, yeah. you know, um, you know that, that kind of stuff. And then, and then that's, that's that golden era. I, sure. All that's from that golden era. There's a couple more I did later on. You know, every now and then I come out of retirement. Yeah. I did Sick of It All, um, Road Less Traveled. Uh -huh. You know, I did um, uh, No Redeeming Social Value, Rap Bones. Uh, I did the two take videos. So every now and then I, I kind of come out and, and do one. And later on, those ones were really great, you know. Sure. Yep. All right, Drew. So as, as you mentioned um, at the beginning and as, as folks familiar with you all, know really well you know aside from 
being a musician, being a, a you know, a, a, you know, cinematographer. Um, you're also a historian and documentarian. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you might want to um, share uh, some of the ways that you're, you know, thinking about the scene has evolved or expanded. Sure. Looking from that angle now. Too. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So, you know, early on, when, when I got into the, the, the American hardcore scene, which was at Boston at the time, it felt really unique and special. Yeah. Like, I felt like I was living in an important time, like, and that we were doing something really um, important. Yeah. And my reference point back then was sort of like the summer of love in San Francisco. Sure. I sort of felt like, okay, I understand what that must have been like, because it is a youth movement. Yeah. And it's different, but the same. Yeah, sure. So even when I was a teenager and I was a part of the first wave of American hardcore up in Boston, I felt like this is important and this should be documented. So I took a lot of pictures. Um, I took, I took, you know, and I wish I would have taken a lot more. Yeah, for sure. But I took a bunch of pictures and I saved a bunch of things and it felt important. Um, people say, well, did you realize you know, did you realize at the time that, you know, you know, though, you know, you know, those times were important. And I always said, yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, I did. I really did. They felt really important. It was a youth movement. It felt like something was happening, yeah. you know? So I think it all comes back to sort of my inherent love of music. And before I was involved in that scene, I just loved music. So, you know, to be a part of that, uh, was really exciting and special, and I wanted to document it any way necessary. And, you know, being that my dad was, um, you know, a, a, had a production company, he had one of the early VHS cameras, yeah. and I would borrow that, and I would go shoot bands. So I was always into, into documenting stuff. Um, and then, you know, later on, of course, had the great run during, during, the, during the music videos. But probably a big, a big, point for me was you know for a while there you charge you charge ahead in time yeah there has to be a certain amount of time passed before you look back and go you know there were that stuff was important you know and it's and, and like maybe there's a documentary yeah. or maybe there's you know or maybe there's a book to be written yeah. you, you need sort of the passage of time to to sort of look back and go you know, that era or whatever. Right. Well, that era started coming into focus in the first, I did a film called XXX All Ages, XXX, the Boston Hardcore film, which basically documented the Boston Hardcore scene that I was a part of from 1981 to 1984. Uh -huh. That film did, the, did some film festivals and got out there and did pretty well. And that led into my next couple of films, um, including the Michael Lago documentary and the New York Hardcore Chronicles film, mm -hmm. which documents the New York Hardcore scene. Before that, I started a page on Facebook called the New, the, called the New York Hardcore Chronicles page. There was no page on Facebook specifically dedicated to the New York Hardcore Chronicle to, to the New York Hardcore scene. I started this page and it blew through the roof. Yeah. Right. It was a, a meeting point for people and, and the whole bit. And at a certain point, I figured out how to make a New York hardcore film. Because it, it can't be done, you know, line, in a linear fashion. It's yeah. just too great a story. I figured out a way to do it. Which is kind of a whole nother story, but I figured out how to do it. So I, I, I did the New York Hardcore Chronicles film. But in doing the New York Hardcore Chronicles page, I, I, a lot of people started coming to me and saying... Hey, I have the, all these photos. They're going to end up in a dumpster. Can I send them to you? Because um, they saw what I was posting on the page. Uh -huh. Now, this is going back, you know, 15, whenever, to 2000 and, you know, early whatever. And, you know, now, you know, people find photos, they scan them, they put them on Instagram. Yep. Back then, there was no Instagram. Nobody had scanners. You know what I mean? So people were like, 
I love what you're doing. And they were sending me their, their personal archives wow. and I was scanning this stuff and I, I was creating a archive, a very vibrant and, 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 and a big archive. The New York Hardcore Chronicles page, you know, eventually reached, you know, 100,000 people. And then I figured out how to do the New York Hardcore Chronicles film. And, you know, I just became a bit of a, um, I've always been a historian. Yeah. And like I said, I always just loved music and and. I collected comics books as a kid. I collected, collected baseball cards. I was always, and, and you know, the one subject that I did well in school was history. Yeah. I, I, I always had a penchant for history. I love history to this day. All I watch is history shows and all I watch is documentaries. So I just began gathering all this ephemera and stuff and putting it in my films, you know, and doing stuff with it. And, uh, you know, that that's that's what really led to it. And then during the pandemic, I started um, my my talk show, the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. And you know, to date, sitting here right now, I've done you know three hundred and twenty episodes. Uh-huh. And from doing that, I, I just became this sort of <laughs> it became my job to do my homework and learn about all these guests. And I just became incredibly knowledgeable when it came to, you know, hardcore and punk and all this stuff. I, I just, you know, all these bands, all these bands that, that I sort of, yeah, I saw them on a flyer or this or that. You know, I would have, have one of the guys as a guest on my show. Now I know about all these bands. I like, I just have such a deep knowledge now about New York hardcore. We're talking about even bands from the Bronx, all these bands from the Bronx that I sort of, peripherally knew about of course now i know all the you know, all these guys yeah, you know, yeah. fahrenheit uh, this uh, so the, the show's been an incredible blessing uh it's 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 really a joy and um you know i just love it and uh it's been it's been a real vehicle for me to to be a, a music archaeologist you know it's, it's just been really great and i love it and i'm very fortunate that you know people love the show people support the show and, you know, it, it pays my rent and bills. Yeah, I'm yeah. a lucky guy. Yeah. And I, I guess another added benefit of it is is you're able to produce these these free shows uh, yeah. now at the Bowery Electric. But it, it was somewhere else before that, right? Uh, 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 another another um, great uh, sort of uh, thing that came out of all this. And, and there's, there's always a, a lineage to it, right? Yeah, sure. You know, it, it's like... Uh, you know, we're talking about the music video days and then starting the New York Hardcore Chronicles page and then doing the film. And then, you know, I created the, the Back to the New York Hardcore Root series initially at the A7, uh-huh. Uh-huh. which is co-owned by a guy named Jesse Mallon, who's an old hardcore kid who used to play the A7 when I was in the High and the Mighty. So all, all these things kind of go back yeah. and, 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 and are intertwined. So I started doing these free... All ages Sunday matinees, initially at the A7, and now at the Bowery Electric. And uh, we're, we're coming up on our 50th show. And it really, it's in the spirit of the old CBGB's matinees that were a block away. And they're great. People bring their kids, next generation. And I tell you, I've done a lot of stuff in my life, you know, films and music videos and books and you know, I've been on many stages, held many mics, took airplane flights, right? Nothing brings me more joy than those shows at the Barry Electric. Yeah. Like when, when the community, the people, the culture, it's free. Everyone's hanging out on the sidewalk. People are meeting people. It just, it really just makes me just feel great. It makes me feel like I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm bringing people together. And uh, ultimately, that, that, that's just like the ultimate joy. Yeah. For me, yeah. yeah. Um, and and another another cool thing about it is, you know, there's people of all ages. They're you know really really young. Yeah. <clears throat> Gym Zers, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever the younger. We we we, we had to sort of like we had to um, draw the line because people were like bringing their toddlers and stuff, <laughs> and like it's dangerous. Yeah, it is. You shouldn't be bringing your two, three, four year old into a bar, into a place where people people are slam dancing. 
So we had to draw draw the line with yeah. that. No babies, no toddlers. Yeah, that's right. But you know, you know, young teenagers. You know, you bring you know ten, eleven, twelve. That's fine with their parents. But um, yeah, ha, ha, you know, having young kids and a lot of bands have sprung up within that. You know, it, it's it's really it's really great. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's really fantastic. You know. Um, where where do you see hardcore? You know, go in in the next ten, you know, ten years or so, something like that. Well. But there's one thing I learned about the whole thing. It's, you know, what I consider hardcore going back from being the first, you know, in the first wave of it is so far removed from what a kid considers hardcore today. Yeah. So, you know, just being the historian I am and, and just seeing how, you know, in the culture, the wave goes in and the wave goes out and sort of things, you know, come around and they go out of orbit and they come back again. You know, thing. You know, art once again is cyclical in nature. You know, all of a sudden, hardcore is the thing, and there's a lot going on, and then it kind of cycles out, and you know, it wanes a little bit, and then it comes back again because you know somebody took the old hardcore stuff and combined it with metal, you know, and, and then here it comes again, and then it go, it just goes round and round, you know, it's like. <laughs> It's interesting. And, and, you know, at this point, I've just resigned myself to just sort of find the humor in all of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is the guy that thought, like, the Beastie Boys sucked. Yeah. You know, I sure. just thought they were horrible. They sucked. Yeah. You know, and then as a hardcore band, they were a joke. Yeah. I, they, they weren't very good. And then here they come back again doing this, like, run DMC sort of mimicry thing, white kids, and sell millions and millions of records. Uh -huh. You know, this is the guy that, like, you know, when Paris Mayhew, when we did the Super Cat video, and it had a cameo with this guy, Biggie Smalls, he said, that guy's going to be a star. And I was like, sure. <laughs> yeah, I doubt it, dude. You know? So, so you know, uh, there's been a lot of that. So, at a certain point, I just resigned myself to, I know I don't know. You know, I know I don't know. And that's the that's sort of the... The, the, the cosmic humor of it. Yeah. That's sort of the merry pranksters humor of it. You know, the, the Ken Kesey, you know, I, I, humor of it. So, you know, I just, I just want to, I'm just, I'm just committed to just enjoying the ride and enjoying being a spectator yeah. and enjoying being of a part and, and enjoy being a part of it. And I'm just grateful that I've been a part of it. And, uh, yeah, I, and I just hope it, it, it just uh, it continues. Yeah. So uh, the final question I have for you, and then I'll I'll ask you if there's you know anything else you'd like to add after that is, right. um, how do you think the Bronx has uh, the Bronx shaped you? You know, whether musically or or otherwise, um, uh, over your really long and vibrant sure. career. Well, I think you know it, it's it's not just my career; it's also my family lineage. You know, being that my father grew up in the Bronx and just, you know, knowing what I know from him growing up, um, you know, in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood, you know, right near Arthur Avenue. And, 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 and you know, my dad tells me that growing up, they would go to Fordham Road and the, the music was um, was, was uh, salsa uh -huh. or, or, you know, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Tito Puente was like the you know these Jewish kids from the Bronx. What they were into was 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 mambo and, and all that. That's what my dad and them were into. You know, so the Bronx has always been an incredible melting pot of different musical styles and, and, and different musical things. And you know, when I lived up here, uh, you know, there was in the seventies. You know, the Bronx was a bit of a mess. Yeah. You, you could, I could see from where I lived the fires that were burning, you know, in the South Bronx when they were burning buildings to collect insurance and things like that. So the Bronx, you know, had a, had a bad name, you know, uh, due to that kind of stuff for many years. And, you know, things, things come back around, you know, thing, you know things die and, and, and they, 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 they're revitalized. And I know the Bronx is... It been revitalized in a lot of ways. I know there's still deep roots here for a lot of people, but you know there, there's whole areas that 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 have been you know reborn and which which is fantastic and and you know mu you know musical uh, movements and influences coming out of there. 
So, you know, I, I think that like a lot of places in New York City, you know, it, it, it's, it's uh, a real cross section of people. It's part of what makes New York so great. And I think it'll always be a cauldron for different cultures uh, to interact and, and, and difficult, different musical movements to come up. I think, I think that, you know, uh, I think in a lot of ways, uh, I think that the Bronx is going to be like the, the, the next horizon. I do this because there's certain parts of the Bronx that, you know, uh, haven't been totally gentrified yet. Yeah, for sure, and for sure. I'm talking like artists, and people like that will gravitate to these places, you know, these old sort of warehouse neighborhoods, auto body shops, you know, you know, even like, even I think of like sort of that Hunts Point area, yeah, yeah. there's parts of that that are just, you know, pretty much, I could see at some point, you know, people just, hey, that's the new place, yeah. you heard? Yeah. You know, that area, you know, the, there's artist lofts. And, and so I, I, I think the Bronx, you know, has, has a, a future. A big future. I, I, it has a lot of futures. You know, a lot of different things. But you know, New York is uh, one thing about New York that remains the same is that it's always changing. Yep, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yep. Um, well, is there anything else you'd like to add that we haven't touched on yet today? Um, not particularly. Uh, I just, I, I just thank you for letting me be a part of it. Um, I, I, this, I, I, I place such a value in in uh, oral histories. And and, and 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 the stuff that you're doing in the Bronx Historical Society and, and this is important stuff and, and you know someday people will look back at it and 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 and, and, and hopefully find value in, in, in what I'm saying and go back and, and look at a lot of this stuff. But to me, you know, this is the most important thing, documenting history. So thank you. Absolutely honored to have you as a yeah. part of it, Drew. <laughs>